This morning, I got up and I went through and I had a wee. Then I went to the kitchen and I made myself the first of many cups of tea of the day. And that's how I start every morning. But for a lot of people, those simple things in life just aren't possible. For somebody with kidney disease, there is a lot of restrictions on what they can eat and what they can drink. So they have to analyse every bite of food they take and they have to count every ounce of liquid that they drink. So leading a normal life when you have kidney problems can be very difficult. We're in Portobello, so I thought we'd go hipster with our kidney description. Um, most people know that kidneys produce urine, but they actually are very, very complex organs. Yes, they do filter your blood and produce urine, but they also absorb nutrients, they secrete hormones and substances that we need, they control the pH of your blood, they control the thickness of your blood, and they help regulate your blood pressure. So when they go wrong, it can be quite, uh, quite a shock to the system and, as I say, make life quite difficult. When somebody has kidney disease, there are a lot of symptoms but it's an invisible disease. There's nothing physical. You can't see when somebody has kidney disease. And it can be very life-changing for them. Initially, it can be treated with dietary restrictions and drugs, but when the kidney failure gets to a certain point, they have to go on dialysis. And dialysis is not a very nice thing to have in your life. It's very time-consuming. You have to go at least three times a week, and it can be four or five hours at a time. It's also very expensive. It costs the NHS about £30,000 a year to keep somebody on dialysis. And it's not a cure. It keeps you alive, but it doesn't perform all of the functions that your kidney would. And after a five-hour session, only 6% of your blood will be cleaned. So you still have to rely heavily on dietary and medication. When you get to a certain point and you're on dialysis, it's not just the patient that suffers, the whole family suffers, because it is very restrictive. If you're committed to five hours three times a week, it can be very difficult to hold down a job, it can be very difficult to sustain a relationship, and the whole family suffers. This is James and his daughter Charlotte, who's two years old. How do you explain to a two-year-old that daddy's got to sit still for five hours? How do you plan a holiday when you've got to go for dialysis? You've got to find a place where you can go, where you can go to a local hospital. Going abroad is almost impossible, and if you do do it, it's very, very expensive. So just a normal family life can be difficult. And it's not just a disease of old age. Most people think of kidney failure as something that happens at the end of your life, but it happens to young people too. So this is Kimberly, who's 15 years old. And I just about remember being a teenager, just about. And it's difficult. It's a hard time of life without having a chronic illness to worry about at the same time. And of course, the Tinies get kidney disease as well. This is Shay, who's three years old, and he's from Glasgow. And he was born with a whole host of kidney problems. Um, but the thing that always surprises me and always pleases me when I meet kidney patients is how positive they are. I don't think I've ever seen a picture of Shay where he wasn't smiling or giggling. They just get on with it. They just manage. But it is a difficult thing to have to cope with. So at any one time, there are almost 6,000 people in the UK waiting for a kidney. This year, 4,000 of them won't get one. And almost one person a day will die while they're waiting. And I don't think that's a very good system that we have in place at the moment. We have the organ donor register, and that's fine, you can sign up to that. But in the UK, only 33% of people have signed up to it. Scotland are doing a little bit better. We're up to about 41%. But when you die, only about one in 100 people will die in a situation where they can actually donate their organs, either because of how they've died or where they've died. <coughs> so not that many people actually can get to donate an organ. And also, you still need family consent. So how many people here have signed up to the organ donor register? I'm not, I'm not trying to shame anyone. How many of you have actually had a conversation with your next of kin about it? That's not too bad, because your family can still override your wishes. So if you signed up to the organ donor register, even if you're carrying your card when you die, your family can still say no. So if you have signed up and you haven't had that conversation, please do, because it's very, very important. And the average wait is about three years for a kidney. 
So is there anything we can do now? Is there anything that you can do to actually help somebody who's waiting? Is there anything we can do to change that system? Well, yes, there is, because in 2006, the law was clarified in the UK so that you could donate an organ to somebody you didn't know. Previous to that, you could donate to a family member or a very, very close friend with special permission. But they decided that if people wanted to give a kidney to a stranger, then that was fine, they could do that. And this is a charity, Give a Kidney, that I volunteer for. And they were set up in 2011. And we, um, we advise people and we point them in the right direction if it's something that they want to do. And we try and raise awareness of it as well. But who's going to be daft enough to do that? <laughs> well, no surprise, that was something I did. So in 2012, I donated one of my kidneys, my right kidney, to somebody that I'd never met and will never meet. That's the whole point of it. It's an altruistic donation or a non-directed donation, so you never know who's going to get your kidney. It's just treated as if it was from somebody who had died, and it goes to the person on the list who you match closest and who needs it most. And I won't pretend that it's an easy thing to do, because it's not. It's major surgery. Um, I read about it in a magazine. I read somebody's story, and I thought I could do that. I thought about it for probably about a year before I actually approached my local hospital and decided to start the process. And it is quite a long, involved process. Um, you have to have lots of medical tests. They have to make sure that you're fit enough physically to have the operation and that your remaining kidney will function correctly at 100%, which it would need to do if you remove the second one. Um, so you have blood tests and urine tests and MRIs and CTs and every test under the sun. You then have to meet all the doctors and surgeons and anaesthetists and again get the okay from them. And you also have to have a full psychiatric assessment because they need to know that you don't have any underlying mental health problems that would prevent you from consenting to this. Um, but also that you understand the risks and that your family understand the risks and that you've thought about all the possibilities. You know, what happens if, if the organ doesn't work when it goes to somebody else? How would you feel about it? So it is a very involved process. It took me about nine months before I was able to donate. Um, and I apologise profusely for showing you a picture of me in my pants, because <laughs> nobody needs to see that on a Sunday lunchtime. But this is the main scar. I have three scars, but that's the biggest one. That was taken about six weeks after the operation. And I'm very proud of my scar. The, the doctors are all very concerned about being able to hide it. I don't care. I'm, I'm quite happy to have that scar because it means something very important to me. I was also given a certificate, and I remember joking with my surgeon. This, this happened to Edinburgh Royal, by the way. It was lo done locally, although I don't know where the kidney ended up. And my surgeon gave me this certificate as a thank you. And I joked with him at the time I was going to hang it in my toilet, because when people get BAFTAs and Oscars, they always say they put them in their toilet. And I thought, I'll do that as well. But then when I thought about it, I thought, actually, that's the best place for it. Because every time I go for a wee, I can look at that and I think, somebody can have a wee through my kidney. And that's brilliant. That, that amuses <laughs> me no end. Um, but I get asked lots and lots of different questions. The first question is, are you mad? And I say, no, I've seen a psychiatrist and I have a bit of paper <laughs> that says I'm not. So that's fine. Um, will it make me more likely to have kidney failure myself? Um, and probably not, almost certainly not, in fact. Um, people can live a full, happy, active life with one kidney and not have any ill effects at all. Um, just as a safety net, when you donate a kidney, you're offered an annual checkup. So I go to the hospital once a year and I have a full examination and lots and lots of tests. And the idea being that if there's any problems, they can catch it very early. Um, I get asked if I have any regrets, and I have two regrets. One is that I didn't wear nicer knickers when I took that photo. <laughs> um, and the other is that I don't have another spare kidney, because if I did, I would do it all over again in a heartbeat, and I would recommend it to anyone who was interested as well. But mostly people just ask me why. That's always the big question. And I wish I had a really interesting, heartwarming story to tell you that sparked me to do this thing. But I didn't. I just read about it in a magazine, and I thought it was a nice thing to do. And that was it, no more, no more complicated than that. And I think if you're given the opportunity to do something kind and you can do that, then I think you should. And that's about it, really. Um, they do get some other funny questions, but they're the only ones I'll go into. So <laughs> what do I want to happen? What do I want from you? 
well, you'd be pleased to hear I'm not going to be taking names as you leave. I'm not going <laughs> to be insisting that people donate a kidney because it's not for everyone. It, you know, it, it's a risky operation. The mortality rate's about one in 3,000. So, you know, there are genuine risks and that's something that you have to consider. Um, but what I would like is for people to raise awareness of it because when I read about this, I didn't even realise you could do it. And I think a lot of people still don't realise that. And the NHS can't recruit because that would be unethical. So it's up to charities and it's up to individuals to raise awareness. So what I want you to do is just tell people about it. Just go home, tell them you met some crazy woman that gave a kidney away. Get, get the awareness out there. Go onto social media, share the story, like the Facebook page of the charity. I don't mind, whatever you want to do just to get the information out there. Because what I would really, really love to happen is for Scotland to be the first country where instead of having a waiting list of people who needed a kidney, we had a waiting list of people who wanted to give a kidney. <coughs> and that would be absolutely fantastic. And then nobody would be dying for a wee. Thank you very much.